Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our next session in the Gulf Association of Endocrine and Diabetes Conference. First of all, I would like to thank the President, Dr. Nisreen, as well as the organizing committee, the scientific committee for inviting me to share with you this scientific meeting. This is including all the Gulf countries. It's very important and for the first time we have it as JIT, Gulf Association of Endocrine and Diabetes. Uh, our session now is talking about and discussing the Adult Clinical Practice Symposium Thyroid. We have four speakers. Everyone will be talking for 25 minutes and then we will have 15 minutes for discussion. If we are ahead of time, we can ask questions in between. The first speaker that I want to introduce, and it's really my honor and pleasure, is Dr. Elizabeth Pierce. Dr. Elizabeth Pierce received her undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard and a master's degree in epidemiology from the Boston University School of Public Health. She is a professor of medicine at Boston University School of Medicine in the section of endocrinology, diabetes, and nutrition. She was the president of the American Thyroid Association between 2018 and 2019. She also serves as the regional coordinator for North America for the Iodine Global Network. She is an associate editor for the Thyroid and the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and metabolism. She also served on multiple editorial boards, including those for clinical endocrinology, endocrine practice, clinical thyroidology, and Lancet diabetes and endocrinology. Professor Elizabeth also co-chaired the American Thyroid Association's 2017 Thyroid and Pregnancy Guidelines Task Force. Her research interests include the sufficiency of dietary iodine in the United States, thyroid function in pregnancy, the thyroid effects of environmental perchlorate exposure, and the cardiovascular effects of subclinical thyroid dysfunction. Dr. Pierce was the 2011 recipient of American Thyroid Association's Van Meter Award for outstanding contributions to research on the thyroid gland and was the 2018 woman in Thyrology Woman for the Year. Now, Dr. Elizabeth uh, would be like to talk today about the thyroid autoimmunity in pregnancy. This is a very important topic. Please, Dr. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I've been asked to discuss thyroid autoimmunity in pregnant women. And I wanna start by just reviewing the epidemiology of thyroid autoimmunity during pregnancy and the natural history of uh, women who are antibody positive over the course of gestation. We'll then talk a little bit about the consequences of antibody positivity for obstetric outcomes in women who are euthyroid, but who have positive thyroid antibodies. And then we'll review the literature looking at interventional trials in those women. So to start with, thyroid autoimmunity is fairly common in pregnancy. Uh, we estimate that somewhere between 5 and 14% of all pregnant women probably are thyroperoxidase antibody positive, and an equivalent number somewhere between 3 and 18% probably are thyroglobulin antibody positive. Women with a personal or family history of any form of autoimmunity are at higher risk. Older women are at higher risk. Women of European ancestry are more likely to have thyroid autoimmunity. Women with either iodine deficiency or iodine excess may be at higher risk for having thyroid autoimmunity in pregnancy. And finally, specifically for the TPO antibodies, iron deficiency seems to be a risk factor. Now, the prevalence of thyroid autoimmunity in pregnancy depends a little bit on when you test. And this is a classic study from Danielle Glinower looking at the likelihood of thyroid autoantibody positivity starting in early gestation in the first trimester, and then following that likelihood over the course of pregnancy. And between early gestation and the time of delivery, on average, there's about a 60% decline 
in thyroid antibody titers, and this is likely related to immune tolerance that sets in during gestation, which we assume is, is essentially nature's way of preventing women from rejecting the fetus as something foreign. In thinking about thyroid disorders in pregnancy, it's always important to think about what does and what does not cross the placenta from mother to fetus. So maternal thyroid hormone does cross the placenta, and that's quite critically important in the first half of gestation when the fetal thyroid is not yet functional. Maternal thyroid antibodies also cross the placenta. So TSH receptor stimulating antibodies in Graves' disease can cross, and I'm actually not going to talk about those today, although happy to take any questions about Graves' autoantibodies during the question and answer at the end. Uh, but TPO antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies do seem to be able to fairly readily cross the placenta. As far as we are currently aware, they do not have adverse effects on the fetal thyroid. Now, thyroid antibody titers are declining as gestation progresses, but actually the permeability of the placenta to those antibodies seems to increase. So the uh, fetus is going to see titers of maternal autoantibodies that are dependent on both of those factors and both of those are shifting as time progresses. The pregnancy is essentially a stress test for the thyroid and in normal pregnancy, thyroid hormone production increases by about 50% starting in early gestation, but women who are thyroid antibody positive may not be able to compensate for the changes in pregnancy and are a bit more likely to develop hypothyroidism uh, in early gestation or as pregnancy progresses. That's seen here uh, in these data suggesting that the women who are antibody negative uh, have lower TSHs overall, and essentially the, the curve for TSH in pregnancy is right shifted in those women who are thyroid antibody positive. Now, thyroid function is shifting in all women across gestation, and part of the reason for that is, is HCG. So we know that human chorionic gonadotrophin increases in pregnancy in the serum until about 10 weeks gestation and then starts to decline. And there's some crosstalk between the HCG and TSH. So HCG at the thyroid can uh, bind to the TSH receptor and stimulate an increase in thyroid hormone production. So the more HCG is around, the more thyroid hormone tends to be produced. And that thyroid hormone will then feed back at the pituitary and cause a concomitant decline in serum TSH levels in early gestation. Now that we've known for some time, but this is a relatively novel analysis done by Tim Korovar and colleagues looking at those same relationships between maternal HCG levels and maternal thyroid function, but here stratifying based on the presence or absence of TPO antibodies. And this was done in two cohorts, so these figures are essentially duplicated, but what you see on the left-hand panel on each side here is what I just showed you that maternal HCG has a positive and very linear association with maternal free T4 and a negative and very linear association with maternal TSH when women are TPO antibody negative. But on the right-hand panels in women with TPO antibody positivity, those relationships get lost. So we think that women who are TPO antibody positive may not be able to mount sort of a normal thyroidal response to HCG in early pregnancy making those women potentially at risk for hypothyroidism. So in the blue line, we see sort of the normal shift in TSH downward in the first trimester and then up again. But here in the red line, TSH in the TS TPO antibody positive women doesn't have that initial decline. In fact, it may increase and it may remain increased throughout gestation. So clinically, what that means is that it's recommended First, it's not recommended to screen women for TPO antibody positivity, so no guideline recommends that. But if you happen to know that a woman is TPO antibody positive um, prior to gestation or in early pregnancy, she should have a serum TSH measured uh, every four weeks or so throughout the first half of pregnancy to just make sure she is not become youth hypothyroid. And if hypothyroidism does occur in those women, then levothyroxine should be initiated. So we need to follow those women carefully in early pregnancy, and we need to continue to follow them carefully after delivery, because TPO antibody positivity in the first trimester of pregnancy is quite a powerful predictor of the likelihood of going on to develop postpartum thyroiditis. And in fact, about half of women who have a positive TPO in early pregnancy will develop postpartum thyroiditis after delivery, um, even those women 
who are already on levothyroxine, but who still have some residuals that thyroid function um, can, can manifest. And so these are patients who need close follow-up if you know that the antibody is positive. Now, what are the consequences of antibody positivity in euthyroid women? Does this matter if it doesn't shift thyroid function? And we have a variety of cohort studies that have looked at this both during gestation and also preconception. So the preconception literature comes from women with known infertility, uh, typically comes from cohorts who undergo assisted reproductive therapies with IVF or IVF with ICSI. This is a meta-analysis looking at the likelihood of delivering a live birth uh, in women who undergo ART based on whether or not they are TPO antibody positive and finding that in fact, those women with antibody positivity are less likely to have successful ART outcomes. In gestation, there's even a wider literature. This is an old meta-analysis, but this has essentially been confirmed um, multiple times since in other cohorts. And we think overall that women who are particularly TPO antibody positive, more than the thyroglobulin ones, uh, have about a twofold increased risk for miscarriage, even when thyroid function is normal. It has been studied a bit less, but we think there's also about a twofold increased risk for recurrent miscarriage, which is mis at least three miscarriages in the same patient. And the other outcome that's been very closely linked to maternal uh, thyroid antibody positivity is preterm delivery. So this most recently has been studied in this very large consortium analysis where we had data from 19 different prospective cohorts, 47,000 pregnant women. Uh, we did an individual participant level meta-analysis and first saw no association of maternal T thyroglobulin antibodies uh, with risk for preterm delivery, but we did see that maternal TPO antibody positivity was linked with higher risk both for preterm delivery at less than 37 weeks and very preterm delivery at less than 32 weeks. And that seems to, that risk seems to be heightened if a woman is not euthyroid but actually has a TSH that's greater than four. What we don't know is why there is this association between maternal thyroid autoimmunity, particularly TPO antibody positivity, and risk for pregnancy loss. And there are a number of hypotheses that have been advanced. So one possibility is that this association is not real at all. This is just all confounding, perhaps by age, that we know that both miscarriage and the likelihood of thyroid, uh, thyroid autoimmunity increase as women get older. Although certainly in more modern analyses like the one I just showed you, age has been controlled for, and we do think this probably is an independent effect. So another possibility is that this is mediated by thyroid function, that these are women who, when TSH is measured in early gestation, are euthyroid, but that because the thyroid is compromised in these women and women may not be able to meet the demands of, of uh, gestation as pr pregnancy progresses, that perhaps TPO antibodies are a marker for women who may have a normal TSH in early gestation, but are destined without intervention to go on and become hypothyroid as pregnancy progresses. So if that's the case, perhaps the appropriate intervention might be thyroid hormone replacement. On the other hand, it's possible that this is directly mediated by antibodies. So one possibility that's been suggested is that we know that at least a subset of women who are TPO antibody positive also make TSH receptor blocking antibodies. And because of the crosstalk between TSH and HCG, it's possible that those blocking antibodies might bind to and inhibit HCG receptors on the corpus luteum, and that might be a reason for early pregnancy loss. Alternatively, it may be that the thyroid and the thyroid antibodies are kind of an innocent bystander here, and that this has nothing to do with the thyroid or the thyroid antibodies per se, but that TPO antibody is just a marker for immunity in general, and that perhaps the pregnancy loss is not mediated really by anything to do with the thyroid at all, but by something about that autoimmune milieu. So altered cytokines or cytokines or increased inflammation or perhaps other non-organ specific antibodies. And when we don't understand underlying mechanisms, it's hard to know what the appropriate intervention should look like. There are three interventions that have been studied in randomized trials to date, and I want to share um, those data with you now. So the first approach that's been attempted is use of glucocorticoids 
Uh, this has not to date been studied in TPO antibody positive women during gestation, but it has been uh, studied in the pre-gestation setting, again, specifically in women who are going to undergo assistive reproductive technology. So this is a small trial, uh, it took 60 youth thyroid women, so TSH less than 2.5, with TPO or um, thyroglobulin antibody positivity. All these women had infertility, were going to undergo IVF. They were randomized to treatment with prednisolone at five milligrams a day, starting at the time of oocyte retrieval and continued till the end of the first trimester if pregnancy resulted. Uh, and the comparison group were women who got no treatment. So what they found in this trial was that there was a significantly increased likelihood for clinical pregnancy in the women who got the prednisolone. There was a marginally significant uh, increase in live birth rates and an insignificant decrease in risk for miscarriage. So overall, a rather positive result, but a very tiny trial. Uh, there's another even smaller trial in the literature that looked at utilization of glucocorticoid therapy uh, in the preconception setting here, not in women who are going to undergo intravito fertilization, but in women who got intrauterine insemination. So here they randomized 48 TPO antibody positive women with infertility to prednisone, uh, which was initiated four weeks before the, in, uh, the IUI procedure, uh, and then started at 10 milligrams a day and then tapered down uh, compared to placebo. And here, again, they saw a significant improvement in pregnancy rates in these women following IUI. They actually saw also, though, a non-significantly increased risk for miscarriage. So results here a little bit more mixed. And overall, what we don't really know very well is what the safety profile is if you're using glucocorticoids in a large number of women throughout the entire duration of gestation. So we have possibly a little bit of signal for benefit. We certainly, I think, don't have good evidence for safety. And right now, guidelines actually recommend specifically against treatment with glucocorticoids in euthyroid TPO antibody positive women who are undergoing ART. Uh, although I think this is a space that probably deserves additional study. So the next therapeutic intervention that's been tried is selenium. And we know that women who are selenium deficient are at higher risk for TPO antibody positivity. So this has now been looked at in three small randomized trials during gestation. Outside the gestational setting, there are a number of other trials looking at selenium treatment and effects on thyroid autoimmunity, and those are, have sort of a mixed, mixed bag in terms of evidence. So some suggest perhaps a decline in thyroid autoimmunity and some do not. In pregnancy, the first of the trials that was done to do this was done by Roberto Negro's group in Italy. They randomized women who were TPO antibody positive on, and euthyroid uh, to 200 micrograms a day of selenomethionine uh, supplementation starting at 12 weeks of gestation and continued for a year uh, postpartum. They uh, had a group uh, who received placebo. They also had a control group who were TPO antibody negative and just age matched who were not treated. And so what you see um, in the blue bars compared to the yellow bars here is that the women who got the selenium supplementation had a lower risk for postpartum thyroid dysfunction in the first 12 years after the first 12 months after delivery, uh, and a lower risk specifically uh, for postpartum hypothyroidism, although risks remained higher than that of those women who were TPO antibody negative. In that study, what they saw is what we would expect to see, that titers of TPO antibodies declined during gestation, as we see in general, that happened in both the selenium supplemented and in the non-supplemented group. But in the postpartum setting, those curves diverge and the women who were treated with selenium had lower TPO antibody titers after delivery. Now, a subsequent trial done in the UK, uh, a little bit larger uh, here and out of about 115 women in each group, supplemented women with a lower dose of selenium, so 60 micrograms a day. Here started at week 12 of gestation, continued till delivery. They did not look at postpartum outcomes, but they looked specifically at the likelihood of TPO antibody positivity and changes in thyroid function. And what they saw in the selenium treated patient compared to the placebo patient was no difference, uh, or at least no statistically significant difference uh, in TPO antibody positivity and no difference in thyroid function. So this was a negative trial. It did use a lower dose of selenium than the other one I just showed you. And a third trial 
looked at yet another dose of selenium. So in this Italian multicenter randomized clinical trial, um, small n, only 45 here, they initiated selenium at 83 micrograms a day, starting at week 10 of gestation and continued till six months postpartum. Uh, they did this in women with both theraglobulin and TPO antibodies, and in a cohort that actually mo many of these women, in fact, the majority of these women had known hypothyroidism and were on levothyroxine. Uh, they looked specifically at antibody titers, and what they found was that in the women who were treated with selenium, uh, both the thyroglobulin and the TPO antibody titers were lower after gestation, but they didn't actually see any differences in thyroid function. And of course, many of these women were hypothyroid already and were on thyroid hormone replacement. So we have three trials all done in Europe, all kind of mixed bag in terms of results. And it's a little bit hard to know if these can be generalized outside the European setting, because for trials like this, background dietary intake probably matters quite a lot. And Europe tends to be a region overall that is relatively deficient in selenium in the diet. But for example, in the US where I practice, we do not have widespread selenium deficiency. Um, and so it may be appropriate potentially in some settings, but not in others. So we do not have strong evidence. We have mixed results of very small trials and current guidelines actually specifically recommend against selenium supplementation for the treatment of TPO antibody positive women during pregnancy. Again, we don't really have strong evidence for benefit and we don't really know um, what the safety profile is of use throughout gestation. This may be very safe, but there are something like 26 different selenoproteins in the body and there may be some off-target effects. So the, the intervention that has been studied most now, where we have a, the, the largest number of trials in the literature to date, is levothyroxine. So glucocorticoids and selenium would be employed on the assumption that it's not uh, thyroid function that mediates pregnancy loss, in patients with thyroid autoimmunity, um, but it is something about the autoimmune milieu. On the flip side, looking at levothyroxine sort of assumes that perhaps the reason for pregnancy loss has to do with subtle declines in thyroid function across gestation. And so the first trial uh, to look at intervention with levothyroxine in TPO antibody positive euthyroid women is this one. This was done by Roberto Negro and colleagues in Italy. And they took women in early gestation who were TPO antibody positive and had normal thyroid function and randomized them either to treatment with low dose levothyroxine or to no therapy. Uh, and they also here looked at controls who were women who were TPO antibody negative. And what they saw in the treated women was quite a remarkable risk reduction for both miscarriage and preterm delivery. So there had been a lot of interest in this trial uh, and a lot of interest in finding out whether these results could be replicated in subsequent studies. And it took over a decade to get the first of those done. So one more recent trial that has essentially looked at a similar question is this one. This is from Faridun Azizi's group in Iran. And here they randomized women who were TPO antibody positive and could have a TSH up to 10. So this is a mixed group of women who have subclinical hypothyroidism and who have euthyroidism. They were randomized at 11 weeks gestation to levothyroxine at a low dose using the same dosing protocol as in the Negro study I just showed you. And the primary outcome here was preterm delivery. And they did in fact see a significant reduction in the risk for preterm delivery in those women who got the levothyroxine compared to the women who were untreated. But importantly for our discussion today, in sensitivity analyses, that benefit really only accrued in women with abnormal baseline TSH, women with a TSH greater than four at baseline. So women who were subclinically hypothyroid and had TPO antibody positivity seemed to benefit from this intervention, but the women who were truly euthyroid did not. Subsequent to that, we have two trials that have looked not in gestational cohorts, but here in cohorts that were uh, enrolled pre-gestation. So this is the postal trial. It was done in China. They screened a large number of women in order to randomize 600 women to a strategy either of treatment with low-dose levothyroxine um, that was titrated to keep TSH normal. This was initiated prior to IVF 
uh, and continued till the end of pregnancy when pregnancy occurred. And the controls were women who did not get treatment. They looked at rates of miscarriage, rates of clinical pregnancy, rates of live birth, and saw no difference in the women who got the levothyroxine compared to the women who were untreated. So a pretty resoundingly negative trial. And subsequent to that, we have another uh, even larger trial. This one published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was conducted in the UK. This is tablet. Uh, again, screened a large number of women preconception. Um, and these were women who were going to either undergo IVF for a history of infertility, as was the case in the trial I just showed you in postal, or they were women who had a history of recurrent miscarriage. So in this trial, some women wound up conceiving naturally and some women wound up conceiving via ART. They were randomized preconception. Uh, levothyroxine here again was initiated pre-conception. Uh, and in those women who became pregnant, it was continued until delivery. Here, levothyroxine was dosed at 50 micrograms a day and was not titrated. And the primary outcome in this trial was live birth at at least 34 weeks gestation. And again, they saw no significant difference between the groups. So another pretty negative trial. In the current American Thyroid Association guidelines, which were published before these recent studies were available, we had recommended consideration of levothyroxine use in TPO antibody positive youth thyroid women with a history of miscarriage. We know these patients are often desperate to have some intervention that might help them carry a baby to term. But in light of these more recent studies, I'm not sure this is advice that makes sense anymore. I am not doing this any longer in my own practice and I suspect this is going to be revisited uh, when guidelines are updated. So I would conclude by noting that prevalence of antithyroid antibodies is fairly high in pregnant women, uh, that those antibodies are particularly TPO antibody associated with increased risk for the development of maternal hypothyroidism and for postpartum thyroiditis. And therefore we need to be monitoring our pregnant patients if we know those antibodies are present uh, to make sure they don't become to develop thyroid dysfunction. Antithyroid antibodies are associated with multiple adverse obstetric outcomes, but most particularly with preterm delivery and miscarriage mechanisms for those associations remain unclear. And so current recommendations, again, monitor women we know are TPO antibody positive or thyroglobulin antibody positive if they're euthyroid prior to pregnancy to remain sure they remain euthyroid. Um, we do not recommend treatment uh, either during pregnancy or preconception with glucocorticoids or selenium, although additional trials probably are going to be needed there. And treatment with levothyroxine can be considered, but benefit is doubtful in light of the most current trials. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, for this nice and excellent uh, review about the thyroid autoimmunity in pregnancy. This is very important and we have a lot of patients uh, and a lot of uh, really challenges managing the TBO positive in pregnancy and IVF planning uh, patients. Uh, I will leave the time for questions in the discussion time. I will leave the floor for Dr. Uh, my dear colleague, co-chairman Naji Al-Juhani from Saudi Arabia. Go ahead, Dr. Naji. Uh, thanks, Dr. Uh... I mean, a nice presentation from Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Tariq al head He will present, uh, present COVID-19 uh, uh, and thyroid dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Tariq al head he is a senior consultant in endocrinology and Hamad Medical Complex, Qatar, and he's an uh, adjunct uh, professor uh, Sudan International University, qualified from Faculty of Medicine, Khartoum University, and he trained in UK, and he get his MRCP in 1992. And uh, he also get uh, uh, endocrinology and general medicine in 1999 uh, FRCP from London and, uh, and to, in London 2003 and Edinburgh 2004. Uh, he's fellow of American of the American College of Endocrinology 2011 uh, lecturer and, at uh, professional department of endocrinology at North uh, Staffordshire. Uh, Dr. Uh, Tariq, he's associate uh, editor of uh, uh, Sudan Medical Journal and associate editor of Journal of Diabetes and the Crime Practice. He has over 60 published paper in peer-reviewed uh, journal. Welcome, Dr. Tari. Thank you very much, uh, Nadi, and uh, thank you very much, the Scientific Committee, for inviting me to give this uh, talk about COVID-19 and thyroid. Um, we know that it is a very much hot topic, and uh, I would like just to start 
by saying that the coronavirus pandemic has started to hit the world since December 2019, when the first cases were actually being reported from Wuhan, China, and then followed that there has been a very unprecedented spread to engulf the whole world. And currently, we are witnessing possibly the effect of vaccines, uh, but at the same time, we are having problems with appearance of new strains. So um, <clears throat> in the sort of uh, thyroid context, would like just to point out that, you know, among the WHO guidelines for COVID management, there is no recommendation for a screening for thyroid dysfunction in patients with COVID-19 infection. Uh, and that was up to actually end of last year. Hopefully things might change because there is a lot of actually um, data emerging um, um, in, the, in the last actually um, one and a half year. The coronavirus, we know that it is a novel RNA virus. It is belonging to the coronavirus family. It is also known as severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. It exhibits a marked actually respiratory tropism and mainly tend actually to present um, with interstitial pneumonitis, which could be quite severe actually, with uh, ARDS. It can progress to severe systemic inflammatory syndrome, and this may lead to multi-organ failure and ultimate death. And uh, the mechanism of cell injury and tissue damage has been actually more and more mapped out. And we do know that actually the virus tend to anchor itself to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptors, as well as other receptors to a variant degree that include the transmembrane protease serine uh, 2, as well as CASBC, in order to gain access and infect cells. Following such actual infection, entry will trigger a cascade of virus replication, and this will result of release of virus and subsequent cell damage. And the whole process uh, is called pyroptosis, which is a form of a rather abrupt um, a variety of a programmed cell deaths. And this will result in release of a uh, whole host of intracellular molecules, um, including um, ATBs, nucleic acids, as well as damage associated nuclear patterns. And this process tends actually to invite you know, and trigger the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines that include um, the uh, family of interleukins, tumor necrosis factor alpha, as well as interferon uh, gamma. And uh, <clears throat> the what is known as the pattern recognition receptors on alveolar and epithelial, uh, as well as in the macrophages, tend actually to detect the release of these uh, molecules. And this actually will perpetuate the uh, um, uh, condition of these patients, and this will lead to severe damage of cells, and this is why we see the condition to be very lethal in, in many patients, unfortunately. So the, the release of several pro-inflammatory interleukins, as I mentioned, also has been shown to lead to immune response with a sort of hyperactivity as well as an uncontrolled systemic inflammatory response, there has been a well-established sort of uh, picture consistent with enhanced T helper 1 as well as T helper 17 immune response. And those tend to be actually tipping towards more inflammation and more generation of cytokines. And uh, this has been involved in, in, in COVID as well as in other SARS infection to resemble some way the immune activation that, that occurs actually in immune mediated thyroid disease. We know that the spectrum of clinical presentation is uh, quite diverse. Cases may be asymptomatic or they might have just mild respiratory symptoms um, or they might have also atypical presentation or sudden and rapid actual development of severe and multi-system disease. 
And we know that, you know, the non-pulmonary complications could involve practically any organs ranging from the CNS to the heart to onset of renal failure to rhabdomyolysis as well as coagulopathy and thrombosis. And endocrine dysfunction has been actually more and more described in this syndrome. Um, <clears throat> so when we move into the uh, context of our theme today for the COVID-19 and the thyroid, it is quite intriguing actually to know that ACE2 in particular, as well as the transmembrane protease serine 2, those are the actually the receptors that facilitate the anchoring of the, um, of the virus to cells. It's ex the expression of these actually molecules, especially S2, is very high in the thyroid, even more in the lungs. And this actually, you know, could be just a drop penny, and that the uh, thyroid, you know, um, uh, S2 expression is actually also very much modulated by sex. And uh, we, we, we know that, you know, it is both positively as well as negatively related to immune signatures. And this include several cell lines that include CD8, T cells, interferon, as well as B cells and natural killer cells. And uh, this tend to happen more actually in males rather than females, which is the reverse of what you see actually in the predisposition for, for thyroid dysfunction. The uptake by host cells of SARS-CoV-2 is also sought to be mediated by other cellular proteases as well as molecules. There is one main group of cellular membrane protein that involved in the uh, um, uh, such link, and this was found to be the integrin, and S2 tend to bind itself to integrin, and this will trigger actually a downstream single trans transduction. And uh, it has also been shown that T4 does re regulate expression of genes for the monomeric protein that make up integrins, and thyroid hormone as well has been shown to promote um, the uh, internalization of integrins. Quite interestingly to know as well, when we mentioned the earlier sort of receptors, uh, the olfactory receptors are co-expressed actually, you know, with S2 as well as TMB RSS2, which is, you know, uh, transmembrane uh, protein serine 2. And this is being actually described that the uh, olfactory receptors is widely expressed in the thyroid, likewise the uh, S2 and the others. And the impairment of the cellular function at the neuroepithelium of the olfactory bulb, as we know, does constitute the molecular mechanism that underlies the anosmia observed in COVID patients, which is a quite actually a sort of a, a typical and quite intriguing actually you know, um, uh, finding as well as complaining these patients. The damage to olfactory receptors due to COVID has been postulated actually to be contributing to the impairment of other organs expressing uh, olfactory receptors, not in excluding the, the thyroid. So there is a sort of a, a quite actually diverse spectrum of uh, involvement of several receptors, actually, when we talk about the uh, thyroid disease in the context of COVID. The thyroid also um, could be indirectly damaged because of the hyperactivity of the T helper 1 as well as the T helper 17, and the cytokine storm has been shown to trigger and perpetuate the thyroid gland inflammation. So at the uh, cellular level, an extensive injury actually to the follicular as well as parafollicular cells um, by the virus has been reported in some studies. And this actually might shed some light on the captivating explanation of increased risk of osteonecrosis in COVID patients. And uh, this is, of course, related to the uh, parafollicular cells. <clears throat> 
not only that, but there has been an evidence to suggest that impairment of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis also does play a role. So it is both actually, you know, um, at upper levels, hypothalamus as well as the, the pituitary, as well as the thyroid. And uh, SAR genomic sequence has been detected in the hypothalamus. Not only that, some actually, you know, um, uh, cutting edge studies have shown that immunohistochemistry of the adenohypophysis revealed that both the number and immune reactivity of sarotrope cells in the pituitary were reduced, denoting that they have been targeted and damaged. So the SARS infection for the thyroid does not only actually affect the thyroid directly, but it can involve actually the, the higher function, including the pituitary and the hypothalamus. And this might be a sort of a direct virus infection or via immune cells or via immune inflammatory responses to the virus through what is known as molecular mimicry, as we know, as a sort of a, a conventional sort of uh, plausible explanation for this problem. So what about the clinical presentations or the clinical syndromes? There has been more and more actual reports for uh, thyroid dysfunction in the context of COVID. Um, studies were mainly, of course, uh, observational. And uh, this has taken actually a description of various and why the spectrum, which might involve non-thyroidal illness, destructive thyroiditis, onset or release of thyroid dysfunction. And I will take you through each one of these. So the uh, thyroid dysfunction might be actually thyrotoxicosis, which actually, you know, being lumped actually into a sort of four main categories, either subacute thyroiditis or painless thyroiditis or a new terminology which has appeared actually of thyroxine thyrotoxicosis. I will come to that, as well as Graves' disease. And of course, hypothyroidism could well be central when the damage to thyrotropes tend to be uh, high or primary. And of course, the non thyroidal illness syndrome tend to be the hallmark of this particular uh, uh, condition. So the non thyroidal illness which is a syndrome of low TCH with low or normal T4 and low T3 is very well recognized and it can happen actually in up to 30% of COVID patients. And uh, um, it can occur at all spectrum of the illness. However, it tend actually to be more marked in those actually who are suffering very severe illness and it can commonly occur with the cytokine storm or the cytokine release syndrome. And uh, <clears throat> it has been suggested that a plethora of cytokines are involved in this uh, problem through various mechanisms. And these include actually interleukins 6, 8, and 10, as well as tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma. Those with low T3 also have been shown to have a low 3T3, 3T4 ratio less than 0.3, suggesting actually a reduced 5 monoiodinase activity that converts T4 to 3. Also, um, uh, there has been some uh, uh, evidence of increased activity of D3 that catalyzes the deactivation of both T4 and T3. And there has been actually a sort of a positive correlation within disease of tissue injury, um, uh, like the liver enzymes and LDH, as well as the inflammatory markers like ER, ESR and CRB. The most important thing is that low or very low T3 was observed in several clinical studies to be a marker for more adverse outcomes. And uh, such actually uh, relationship and association warrants a sort of longitudinal follow-up of COVID patients with isolated T3 for further potential prognostic implications. Maybe sort of uh, treatment of these patients uh, might be ac actually considered. Next, we'll move into the destructive cyrotoxicosis. Cyro 
And this might be, of course, subclinical or clinical, and it may take the form of either subacute thyroiditis or painless thyroiditis, and the subacute disease may occur in between 15 to 20 percent of COVID-19 patients. It is neither associated with autoimmune or, or non-immune thyroid disease, um, and uh, people who have got previous history of thyroid disease are not at special risk for development of this uh, variety, and neck pain is the hallmark of the disease. This is in contrast to the other sort of varieties, and I will come to that. The classical course of the destructive thyroiditis is like any other sort of subacute thyroiditis where an initial phase of hyperthyroidism will be followed by a transient hypothyroidism phase, then eventual recovery of the thyroid function to EU thyroidism. And this might take up to a period of six months and it can occur either simultaneously with the uh, illness at its peak, or it might actually uh, occur in the period following its resolution. Um, um, just in practical terms, transient toxicosis in these patients, you know, uh, when it is uh, uh, severe, it has, of course, to be treated symptomatically with beta blockers. Um, and uh, all types of thyroiditis, as we know, um, can progress to permanent hypothyroidism. And here, in this context, it is not an exception. The atypical thyroiditis is uh, characterized by classically by absence of neck pain, and this has been thought to be due to lymphopenia. And it has been suggested that it can occur in up to 15% um, 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 uh, of cases. And it was first actually recognized in COVID patients admitted to ICU. And of course, the hallmark is quite actually, you know, intriguing because there is a low TSH with low FT4. However, the uh, FT, sorry, with low FT3, but there is a normal or high FT4. And then they have coined the uh, synonym of thyroxin thyrotoxicosis. It is more frequent in males. And, it, and this might actually be explaining the gender difference in the immune signatures associated with S2 at the thyroid level, as we mentioned earlier. Hypothyroidism tend to be relatively rare complications, and I will come to this when I share with you our clinical experience in our own center from Qatar. Um, uh, it does not actually exceed 5% of cases, and in these 5% of cases, it is mainly actually overwhelmingly subclinical. And, uh, and it has been shown to be secondary to chronic autoimmune thyroiditis. And this may occur during or after COVID, like other form of thyroiditis mentioned earlier. And it is associated with grave prognosis. However, central hypothyroidism tend to be actually, you know, despite in the overall picture, it is rare. But um, the reversal of hypothyroidism does occur in most cases in contrast to the primary one. And this may represent a sort of a transient sort of effect on the uh, hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. What about Graves' disease? Graves' disease has actually received a sort of a quite special uh, uh, and distinctive, actually, uh, interest. Uh, because we know that, you know, the, the, the pathophysiology of the uh, Graves hyper, uh, hyperthyroidism or Graves thyrotoxicosis tend to be very much an autoimmune process. And of course, we know that the autoimmune process is well recognized to be triggered by SARS-CoV-2. And uh, cases of antiphospholipid syndrome, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, as well as Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, has been actually well described to be triggered by Graves' disease. And uh, this has been shown to persist long after the resolution of COVID-19. So a sort of a, a propagation of the immune response uh, might be the case. And uh, there is evidence for COVID to amplify or promote uh, uh, autoimmune disorders in general, 
and SARO disease is not an exception. So what is the situation for grave disease and COVID up to fall um, 2022, the story so far? Up to June 2021, there has been only five cases of Graves disease reported in the literature, and that has been reviewed actually in the excellent review published, you know, a few months ago by Dr. Morgan and Professor Ali Zahrani from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, five more cases actually of Graves disease from our own center. And uh, our work has been actually you know, destined for uh, publications. Um, all the 10 cases were females except one, and they were diagnosed roughly around 30 to 60 days after the primary infection with COVID, and all actually were sort of young to middle age, ranging between 21 to 61 years of uh, uh, age. Uh, four patients out of these 10, uh, had prior history of Graves' disease, which went into remission several years ago, i.e. there has been a, a sort of a reactivation of the immune process. One from our own center and three from the other five uh, reported cases in the literature. What are the postulated mechanisms? Um, uh, Ali Zahrani and uh, Morgan actually has reviewed you know, the evidence in terms of basic science as well as in terms of clinical, and they have published this. And, uh, and actually, I recommend that, you know, to read that excellent paper published in Endocrine of June this year. There is a description of a phenotypic expression of SARA autoimmunity, which has been, you know, uh, very much linked to the uh, balance between T helper one and T helper two when the uh, situation actually um, uh, tend to tip the balance for uh, T helper one, there will be no problem of thyroid autoimmunity and the reverse will occur. And uh, the uh, sort of a very dominant T helper one mediated immune response is likely to trigger apo apoptopic pathways in the thyroid follicular cells resulting in destructive of thyroid disease. However, on the other hand, the T helper cells immune mediated activity is likely actually to activate antigen and specific B lymphocytes to go ahead and make TSH receptor antibody. And that will result in proliferation of thyroid cells and their hyperactivity of uh, these cells resulting um, in thyroxicosis. Stress has been shown to shift the balance towards the, the, the T helper to that favors development of Graves' disease. Further, other cell lines like regulatory CD4 and T cells, which is known as TREX, they do inhibit actually the effector T cells, and these could differentiate into either T helper 1, T helper 2, or T helper 17, and this is dependent on the cytokine milieu. The more you have of the cytokine milieu as you have in the setup of COVID, the more you will have, you know, propagation of this sort of particular pathway. So activity of these cell lines has been shown in animal models to augment cytokine production and activation of autoimmune diseases. And possibly this is what is happening actually in the context of thyroid disease triggered by, by SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that, you know, the most important and the more, more captivating evidence is that SARS-CoV-2 has the evidence to be associated with hyperinflammation that induces actually T helper 17. And T helper 17 is well known to um, trigger the viral induced uh, Graves disease. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the problem of the uh, um, um, sort of uh, the receptors that actually trigger the whole problem is very much actually reaching the thyroid. And when they interact with the virus, this will generate problem. The virus itself will trigger, of course, as we have shown, a sort of a pro-inflammatory pathways that invo involve so many cells as well. So just in the last two slides, I would like to 
um, um, go very quickly over our center experience. We have actually just stumbled to begin with on a couple of cases, and then we started actually to ask colleagues to tell us about any patients with thyroid problem. And this has been collected between October 2020 up to July 2021. It is mainly an outpatient facility and uh, eight cases of thyroid dysfunction, five cases of Graves hyperthyroidism, as I alluded to earlier, one case of chronic autoimmune thyroiditis with primary hypothyroidism, um, one case of atypical thyroiditis with thyroxine thyrotoxicosis, and one case of subacute thyroiditis. So in summary, the evidence for SARS-CoV-2 virus in causing thyroid dysfunction is accumulating. This is clinically meaningful to the extent that it warrants more vigilance. Screening, therefore, may be warranted uh, almost in all patients because thyroid function test is cheap and readily available. More clinical and basic research is expected to come to the fore in the period ahead. And I would like just to pay tribute to those who have contributed actually to our clinical experience with COVID-19 and, 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 uh, and infection, including Dr. Zainab Dabous, Dr. Mohammed Bashir, Dr. Wajiha Gul, Dr. Stephen Beer. And I would like also to thank Dr. Ali as Zahrani from Riyadh for very helpful discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Tariq, for the nice presentation. Uh, discussion will be um, uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Amin, now he will present for the second uh, speaker. Thank you, Dr. Naji. Thanks, Dr. Tariq, for the great presentation. Uh, well, we'll move to next speaker, Professor David Cooper. Uh, professor David Cooper is currently a professor of medicine and radiology at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has served as a contributing editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, and as the deputy editor of the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Currently, Professor Cooper is an editor-in-chief for endocrinology for UpToDate. He is one of the editors of the Ionic textbook Warner and Engbar, the thyroid. He is the past chair of the subspecialty board for endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism of the American Board of Internal Medicine. Professor Cooper is the past president of the American Thyroid Association and the recipient of the American Thyroid Association's Distinguished Service Award and Paul Star Award, the Distinction in Endocrinology Award that is given by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the Endocrine Society Outstanding Scholarly Physician Award. Please join me to welcome Professor David Cooper to present the, to the subject about long-term antithyroid drug therapy for Graves' disease. Please, Professor Cooper. Hello, uh, my name is David Cooper, and I'm happy to be with you to be talking about long-term antithyroid drug therapy. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about here is an outline about uh, the fact that people do have remissions after a course of antithyroid drug therapy, as you know, I'm sure. And the question is, is there a relationship between the duration of therapy and the chances that a person will have a remission? And if drugs do play a role in remission in some way, what are the mechanisms? Another question is that if a person doesn't seem to be in remission, let's say their antibodies are still positive, um, is it better to move on to treat them with, let's say, radioactive iodine, or to keep them on antithyroid drugs indefinitely in terms of their clinical outcomes? And then finally, I want to speak about the clinical use of antithyroid drugs long-term in clinical practice. And of course, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with clinical practice guidelines that are put out by the American Thyroid Association and by the European Thyroid Association that go into much of what I'm going to say in much more detail. Now, here's a typical patient with Graves' disease, a young woman. Uh, she's 20 years old, typical signs and symptoms. She has mild eye findings and a goiter, and you can see her original thyroid function test, elevated free T4, elevated T3, low TSH, and positive anti-TSH receptor antibodies. And you discuss various options for therapy with her, including antithyroid drug therapy, radioiodine, and surgery, and she decides that she'd be 
more comfortable with a course of antithyroid drugs. She wants to avoid radioiodine and surgery, and she's also hoping that she'll have a remission and won't have to be on any medications at all. Now, before we start talking about this, I can't move forward without uh, talking about Dr. Edwin Aswood. Uh, as many of you know, he's the father of antithyroid drugs and the drugs we use today. And I just want to mention that uh, in 1945, he delivered a lecture called the Harvey Lecture uh, when he was at Harvard. Uh, and one of the uh, excerpts that I found in this amazing prescient paper is this. Some of the patients taking daily thyroid, Uracil, this was the drug they were using at the time, for many months became tired of their pills and decided they didn't need medicine any longer. Surprisingly enough, they remained well, one of them for two years now. This accident suggested that the drug might well be withdrawn from other patients and was arbitrarily decided that six to nine months might be a sufficiently long period of treatment. So this is, uh, as far as I can tell, the first hint that taking an antithyroid drug for a period of time might ultimately lead to a remission where the person could be well without any medicine at all. And in fact, later on uh, in 1953, a series of patients from uh, Dr. Aswood's uh, unit was published uh, showing that um, about 50% of patients uh, remained well after stopping the medication. And again, this paper, uh, that earlier paper and this one used the term remission and relapse and recurrence uh, the way we use today. These were the first examples of using these terms uh, in this paper. And then uh, another uh, paper from the same unit in 1966, uh, almost 200 patients uh, followed for six years after antithyroid drug therapy and about half experienced remissions, which continued from six to 20 years. And recurrences, if they were going to occur, usually occurred within the first year after treatment, and very rarely did it occur uh, more than six years after treatment had been stopped. So um, the question is, uh, the, the patient has started on methimazole, 15 milligrams a day, and how long should you be treated? And does the treatment duration affect her chance of remission? And once we start, when are we going to measure anti-TSH receptor antibodies again, if we are? Let's talk about treatment duration. Um, back in the 1990s, um, there were four randomized controlled trials uh, that showed that the duration of treatment didn't seem to have much of an effect uh, on remission rates. So here are the four treatments and the squares are the months that patients were randomized to in each of the studies. And you can see that in the first study by Alanek, that uh, six months didn't seem to be as good as 18 months. But in the other studies, whether the person took the drug for 12 or 24 or 18 or 42 months, it didn't seem to matter very much. And these data were the data that were used by the American Thyroid Association to recommend that after methimazole is started, uh, the drug should be given for 12 to 18 months and then stopped if the TSH and and the TSH receptor antibodies are normal at that time. Now, um, I want to call your attention to this really important paper from uh, Azizi in Iran that was published in 2019, because this paper uh, has turned the whole field upside down in a way. But uh, it's, I think it's a very important paper. So I've shown this paper here at the end, and, uh, and I'll show you the data, but basically, Patients who took the drug for 18 months had about a 50% uh, relapse rate, whereas in those patients given the drug, methimazole, that is, for five to 10 years, uh, there was a very low 15% remission rate. So this is the outline of the study, 258 patients treated with methimazole for 18 months, half continued to take the drug for five to 10 years, the other half stopped treatment, and the relapse rate was much, much higher in the group that discontinued therapy after 18 months. And then this is just the uh, figure from the study showing uh, re re relapse rates among the two groups. <clears throat> now, um, these are data from uh, a paper by Lauberg et al. published in 2008 showing uh, anti-TSH receptor antibody levels after three modalities of treatment, surgery, radioiodine therapy, and antithyroid drug therapy. You can see that after surgery and, uh, and antithyroid medication, 
uh, levels of anti-TSH receptor antibodies tend to fall and become normal after a year or so. And as you well know, radioiodine uh, therapy leads to increases in levels of these antibodies. And this is actually thought to be one of the reasons that thyroid eye disease may worsen after radioiodine treatment. The question is, uh, if the antibodies do go down with medication, why is this? What are the potential mechanisms for this? So um, there's one possibility, and that is that uh, just amelioration or improvement in the hyperthyroid state with normalization of T4 and T3, that may lead to correction of a dysregulated immune system that has been perpetuated by being hyperthyroid. Another possibility is that uh, the drugs themselves uh, somehow have a direct effect on the immune system within the thyroid on T cell function, let's say. So here is the first explanation. Being hyperthyroid somehow perpetuates an autoimmune aberration where you have hyperthyroidism, autoimmune aberration, just a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. And methimazole breaks this uh, and leads to remission. The other possibility is an indirect effect is that uh, there may be direct effects of the drug on the immune system. Uh, this is a study published uh, in 2001. Uh, the top is a thyroid biopsy in a patient with Graves' disease, looking at HLA-DR expression. HLA-DR is the antigen presenting um, molecule on the surface of thyrocytes. And you can see that uh, a biopsy of the same patient after methimazole therapy showed decreased expression of HLA-DR immunostaining suggested a direct effect on the immune system by methimazole. Now, uh, as I showed you, antibody levels do go down after antithyroid drug therapy is initiated. And in this paper from Lauberg, uh, the same paper I showed you earlier, you can see that the levels do go down. But in some patients, the levels actually become normal. And if they do, there's a 30% chance uh, of recurrence after uh, the drug is stopped. But if they go down but never quite reach normal, then there's a very high rate of relapse. So although the antibodies go down in almost everybody, it really depends on how much they go down. If they become normal, then the relapse rate is low. If they go down but the drug is stopped and they're not normal, at the time the drug is stopped, there's a high rate of, rate of relapse. So this is why uh, the ATA says that measurement of these antibodies prior to stopping the therapy is suggested. In fact, I think most people do this now. And this aids in predicting which patients can be weaned from the medicine uh, with normal levels indicating greater chances of remission. Now, that graph is really a simplification of the reality and the complexity of all of this. And this is a study from Japan where patients, uh, almost uh, 550 patients with Graves' disease were treated with antithyroid drugs for many, many years. And anti-TSH receptor antibodies were monitored uh, frequently in these patients. And they were divide, able to divide up the group into three groups. First, the group that had what they called smooth remissions, where antibody levels became normal within a year or two and stayed normal, and patients remained in remission without antithyroid drug therapy. Another group, which they called fluctuating remissions, where patients' antibody levels became normal. The red line is the upper limit of normal, but then bounced back up again repeatedly. So they needed uh, continuing therapy. And then a group, which they called smoldering remissions, where the antibodies went down, but only after many, many years of treatment. And then a group, which they called smoldering non-remissions, where the antibodies really never went down, even after many years of treatment. And in a graphic way, then, if you combine this study with another uh, review uh, diagram in a review article by Dr. Fersinga, um, we have three groups of patients. We have in the green line patients who have a smooth remission. This is about 40% of all patients where the antibodies go down over time, over a couple of years, and the patient remains in remission indefinitely. We have other patients, the fluctuating patients, again, about 40% of the total the antibody levels go down, the patient's in remission, but when the drug is stopped, after a year or two, uh, they become hyperthyroid again. 
And then you put them on the drug and they're fine, but then it comes back again over and over and over again. And then finally, there's the smoldering remission where uh, most patients uh, don't develop a remission. Now, another question is whether uh, antithyroid therapy leads to better clinical outcomes than radioiodine therapy for patients who are not in remission. So here is a typical algorithm. Uh, Graves' disease is diagnosed. Patients are put on methimazole. The antibodies are measured. And uh, if they're normal, you can stop the medicine. And uh, if they're not normal, you would still continue the medicine or move on to radioiodine or surgery. And if the patient relapses again, you would restart methimazole or move on to radioiodine or surgery. And the question is, which one of these options is best for the patient? And so uh, I want to just review uh, one study. There are several, uh, but just one looking at this question. How do clinical outcomes compare? Actually, there are two studies I'll show you. First, uh, this was a retrospective study of 238 patients who relapsed after methimazole treatment for one to two years. Half got radioiodine. The other half uh, were uh, restarted on methimazole, which they then took for six to seven years. And what the study showed is first, uh, in terms of thyroid function, more patients taking methimazole had normal serum TSH levels. That is to say that if you look at this graph, uh, more patients with, uh, who had received radioiodine had mild hypothyroidism. That is, they were not on an adequate dose of their levothyroxine therapy. Weight gain was greater in patients who received radioiodine compared to those who stayed on methimazole. And then finally, thyroid eye disease in a small proportion of patients was worse in patients who had been treated with radioiodine versus those who went back on methimazole. And in this study of um, almost 1,200 patients who had been treated with radioiodine surgery or antithyroid drugs previously, uh, they were mailed questionnaires, uh, which asked them about specific thyroid-related questions, as well as the 36 short-form health status survey. And uh, the red line here, these are the different uh, domains in the survey. The red line is the general Swedish population. And um, what they found was, regardless of the treatment, Patients who had Graves' disease had worse thyroid-related quality of life six to 10 years after diagnosis compared to the general population. But um, patients who had been treated with radioiodine, this is shown in this black line, had worse outcomes compared to those patients who had been treated with antithyroid drugs or thyroidectomy. So going back to our patient now, um, she's begun on methimazole, normalization of thyroid function. After 12 months for therapy of therapy, her Free T4 is normal, TSH is normal, but her antibodies are still positive. So what should be done next? And again, I showed you uh, this diagram here. Uh, the antibodies are still present in this patient. And so we need to decide whether sh we should put her back on methimazole uh, or continue the methimazole or move on to definitive treatment. And what I'm going to propose here is this is a patient who would be a good candidate for long-term methimazole therapy. So let's move on and just talk about that briefly. So in the guidelines, if a patient with Graves' disease becomes hyperthyroid after stopping uh, methimazole or has positive antibodies, consideration should be given to treatment with radioiodine surgery, but low-dose methimazole treatment for longer than 12 to 18 months may be considered in patients not in remission who prefer this approach. And of course, many patients do prefer this alternative. Now, this is not a new idea. This is uh, a lecture called the uh, American Medical Association lecture given by John Eager Howard in 1967. Uh, he was at that time the chief of endocrinology at Johns Hopkins. Speaking about antithyroid drug therapy, he said, the approach to the therapy of aerotoxicosis is to control the disease for a lifetime if need be with a drug such as purple biouracil, which is what the dominant drug was back then until spontaneous remission occurs. And in this study published in JAMA in 1979, 80 patients given for uh, long-term antithyroid drug therapy with a remission rate of 76% after an eight-year follow-up. And they said the major drawback to antithyroid drug therapy for hyperthyroidism is the frequent reappearance of thyroid toxicosis when treatment is stopped. However, one can, of course, not stop, but rather continue therapy indefinitely. 
And then uh, this most recent paper by Azizi uh, in 2021, they looked at 59 patients who had been on methimazole for 14 years. 32 of them decided to stop the drug. 27 continued the drug for additional few years. And then all patients were followed for six years. Of the 32 that stopped, relapse occurred in 20%. Of the 27 who continued, of course, all remained normal with negative antibodies. The mean dose of methimazole to maintain normal thyroid function decreased gradually, and after 24 years was 2.5 milligrams a day. There were no adverse reactions over um, several decades of treatment. And then this is just a graph from this study, uh, the 19% relapsing in the dashed line after 14 years, in the solid line of the group that continued the drug. And this is just a chart from that study showing the methimazole dose starting out at about 10 milligrams a day and going down to about 2.5 milligrams a day after 24 years. Uh, mean uh, serum TSH levels were normal for all that time. And uh, antibody levels, of course, were high to start with, but then uh, became normal over time. But again, the drug was not stopped. It just continued uh, without uh, measuring the antibodies necessarily. So uh, in the guidelines, uh, Continued low-dose methimazole may be considered in patients not in remission who prefer this approach, of course. And uh, what Azizi says in his paper is that long-term uh, methimazole may be prescribed effectively even throughout the patient's life for those with Graves hyperthyroidism who do not desire ablation treatment. Low-cost, safe, and effective drugs are prescribed as lifelong therapy for some specific diseases, such as epilepsy, inflammatory bowel disease, and hypothyroidism, and methimazole may be added to the list of lifelong drugs for control of Graves hyperthyroidism. So um, what I'm proposing here is the patient uh, is treated with methimazole for three to five years. You could then measure the antibodies. If they're normal, you could stop the drug. If they relapse or if the antibodies are still there, you just continue long-term methimazole therapy. Now, who would this be appropriate for? Uh, people with mild disease on low-dose methimazole with a history of relapse children and adolescents, patients with thyroid eye disease who want to avoid radioiodine, anybody who doesn't want ablative therapy is doing well on a stable dose of methimazole, and the elderly, uh, I think, may be better served by receiving definitive therapy with radioiodine rather than risking having uh, a, a person in their 70s or 80s stopping the drug and becoming recurrently hyperthyroid. So, uh, Antithyroid drug therapy leads to long-lasting remissions in at least 50% of patients, maybe more. Uh, the duration of therapy may increase uh, the remission rate, as I showed you in the Azizi randomized trial. But even if there's a relapse after drug discontinuation, resuming methimazole may lead to better clinical outcomes that I showed you by uh, the study by Villagillian and Turing. And so one approach that could be considered is long-term, that's five to 10 years of uninterrupted therapy without stopping the drug or checking the antibodies to see if there is a remission. Now, just go back to this uh, publication that re is really just the, uh, the draft of this lecture he gave, the Harvey lecture back in 1945 by Astwood. And what he said is that means, when means are found to prevent the occurrence of toxic reactions from antithyroid drugs, or when a compound is discovered which does not give right to side effects, then it will be possible to treat all cases of hyperthyroidism by medical means. And with that, I will thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, address you today on antithyroid drugs. Thank you, Professor uh, Kuber. Very excellent and nice uh, presentation answering all my queries about the long time giving our patients antithyroid drug and have sometimes the occurrence of this case. Uh, now I will uh, move the floor to Dr. Naji, please, for the next speaker. And next speaker, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease and thyroid cancer will be presented by Dr. Ali Khalil. Dr. Ali Khalil, uh, he's um, a consultant in endocrinology at the Imperial London Diabetes Center Abu Dhabi, and uh, I just associate professor at uh, university, uh, UAE University. He is graduated from University of Marseille, France, and trained in telemedicine at Queen University uh, in Toronto. Uh, he also um, uh, is a fellow of Canadian College of Physicians and American Board Certified in Internal Medicine. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Ali also, uh, he's uh, a former president of uh, Ontario Diabetes Association of Canada and past president of um, ACE uh, Gulf chapter. Uh, he continue uh, active uh, in education and research and he has been teaching undergraduate endo endocrinology at UAE University for the last uh, five years. His publication reflect interest in a wide aspect of diabetes and endocrinology. Welcome, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much, Dr. Naji. And thanks for the organizer really for inviting me to give this talk. And it's a challenge to do it after the uh, excellent talk by Dr. David Cooper. Uh, so basically what we looked, we uh, have a total of 448 uh, uh, patients that underwent surgery. Um, those uh, who went for surgery actually were for the specifically for, especially for the one with uh, multinodular uh, goiters, uh, underwent ultrasound uh, assessment and 70 to 80 percent of them uh, had uh, biopsy to uh, rule out the presence of uh, malignant thyroid. Uh, those with uh, uh, indeterminate thy 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 thyroid uh, cytology were uh, excluded from the study. And interestingly, uh, when we look at the group with the non-toxic multinodular goiter versus the one with hyperthyroidism, which included Graves and toxic multinodular goiter, the uh, prevalence rate between the two groups was very similar, but somehow higher than what he'd be described in the literature between 10 and 12 percent. We were close to 20 percent. And this has been described in certain other papers and other areas in the world. Uh, so the low prevalence that we know about is not always uh, consistent. Um, uh, having said this, when we looked at the um, uh, relationship between the non-toxic multinodal goiter and toxic multinodal goiter, the prevalence rate was higher in the toxic group versus the one non-toxic, and that was non-significant uh, statistically. Um, so in our, the message we got out of this is that uh, we have to be, uh, is it only simple coincidence, but if it's coincidence, the percentage is a, li a little bit higher than what I would uh, have expected. Mind you, the study it is with retrospective. The hospital is a tertiary hospital, with, and the sample are mainly all surgical specimen. So uh, it, one has probably to rely on the longer studies, more prospective studies, to have a full idea of really what is the real picture in this case. But while reviewing the pathology report, we noticed that there is mention of really uh, the presence of uh, some form of thyroiditis, either diffuse, focal, or type sometimes nodular thyroiditis. And that hence uh, uh, got me to look again, uh, uh, since there is dramatic rise of the incidence of PTC, uh, we know that Hashimoto's thyroiditis has been going up uh, incidence wise. And uh, the question here is, is there a potential established pathogenic link connecting inflammation with, uh, with cancer? And then uh, just for the sake of the presentation and for those reviewing the literature, autoimmunity in the literature, literature is defined by the presence of autoantibodies to thyroid globulin and thyroid peroxidase antibodies and or hypo or heterogeneity on ultrasonography and or histopathological evidence of antithyroidal diffuse or focal inf uh, inf lymphocyte infiltration. Now, interestingly, I thought really i coming with something new, but again, um, going back to 1955, it was the first description uh, reported by Daly and Lindsay um, in the uh, archive of surgery, um, about eight cases uh, of the who went for surgery and found to have uh, papillary thyroid cancer along with uh, thyroiditis. And when we review the literature a little bit more extensively, uh, there is a lot really uh, to read. And but between the lines, you have to notice that most of the studies are retrospective studies, and only recently there have been only maybe one or two prospective studies related to this issue. And when you look at this systematic review between 1955 and 2017, uh, reporting on 64,628 patients, 
and they are looking at the association between Hashimoto's thyroiditis and thyroid cancer. Uh, you look at that the pool effect of the relative risk between the different types of cancer and control was quite significant for papillary cancer and for thyroid lymphoma, but not so much for the other type of cancer like the follicular medullary or anaplastic thyroid carcinoma. And this has been even proven further uh, by another meta-analysis of 30 studies, including um, uh, close to 10,700 patients of PTC cases, where they looked at the pathology specimen and they looked at really the presence or absence of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And histologically proven, thyroiditis was identified in 23.2% of the cases of PTC identified. And then when you look at the PTC coexisting with Hashimoto's, they found that there's a, uh, a close uh, a frequency seen in female patients uh, with OR of 2.7. And when the interesting point is that notice the multifocality that was relevant point from their study uh, but when it comes to extratidoidal extension, lymph node metastases uh, doesn't seem to be uh, a bare relationship. Uh, but the point they made uh, that uh, when they looked at the relationship with thyroid cancer, with Hashimoto uh, thyroiditis, they found they were significantly associated with long recurrence of pre-survival. And hence for them, the presence of Hashimoto thyroiditis is somehow beneficial, providing some really better prognosis uh, than when it's not present. But this has not been replicated in further studies, at least in some of the other studies. Now, this is another uh, paper uh, by uh, paper from Turkey, uh, looking at 20 year study, looking at the relationship again between Hashimoto's thyroiditis in papillary thyroid carcinoma. And then it, uh, they, the Hashimoto thyroiditis uh, was detected in non-neoplastic area in the surgical specimen uh, in 36.1, a little bit higher than the other meta-analysis that I uh, just recently described. Um, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and this in 1,080 patient with diagnosis of papillary thyroid carcinoma whereas Hashimoto's thyroiditis was not observed in 63.9%. There was again a significant positive correlation between the presence of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and multifocal location, again confirming the previous, previous findings, but there was no significant relation between excess thyroidal tissue invasion and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And if lymph nodes were present, as noted in other studies, it looks like there is a predilection for the central lymph node compartment rather than other ones like the lateral or uh, the lateral compartment. Now, in there, they in incline that maybe when there is, especially uh, the, uh, there is a, l a large goiter with uh, nodularity, maybe uh, with the fear and the diagnosis was made his cytologically uh, of thyroiditis, maybe that will maybe something to consider surgery in this case, but again, uh, this is only the opinion of the authors in this study. Now, other characteristics is that seems that there is age dependency on uh, the aggressiveness or the behavior of the association. In patient more than 45 years of age, Hashimoto thyroiditis in patient with PTC was associated with lower stage disease and less disease persistence. On the other hand, the presence of uh, thyroiditis appeared to be associated with unfavorable pathological features in those with less than 45 years. And when, when you look at the children population and younger population, that association seemed to have special clinical pathological characteristics manifested in the form of multifocality, small nodular size, in addition to familial occurrence. So there are really some nuances and variation in the way that things really seem shown when we look at uh, pathological specimen from surgical specimen. 
But when you look at compare cytology, studies that look at cytology versus surgery, the results of the study addressing this association seem to work different, different whether surgical specimen versus cytology material were considered. So in this uh, graph, as you can see, the small triangle be, being the one who are subjected to, cyto to cytology uh, versus the one based on surgical spe specimen in squares, uh, the one with, uh, who had uh, looked at cytology as such, they did not exceed 2.5 to 3% prevalence rate compared to the other group where they reach 35 to 37%. And, uh, but again, this was attributed maybe to the uh, sampling error uh, that uh, surgery is more complete Perfect. and that, um, the, um, uh, that uh, the, the presence of indeterminate cytology sometimes, which consists roughly to be around 30%, might be also a contributing factor. Uh, but this really was, again, um, clarified based on this uh, prospective cohort study. Uh, it's a combined study uh, including uh, 9,851 patients from, it's a multi-center study um, from uh, uh, US, Boston, uh, Mass General, uh, from Rio de Janeiro and China, uh, where they looked at uh, 21,370 nodules with a total of 14,063 of the nodule evaluated with FNA. And when you look at the, it, uh, when you look at the population with Hashimoto's, it's expected, as in the study, that the group of indeterminate cytology was higher than the other group, and then the rate of malignancy in the group with uh, thyroiditis was uh, higher than in those with non-thyroiditis. Uh, and when you look at the relative risk of having one or more malignant nodules, it doesn't seem to be different whether you have one or more nodules. The relative risk is higher in those who have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, now, just a small note to make here that the type of thyroiditis seem to have influence of the prevalence rate of papillary thyroid carcinoma. And those presenting with nodular thyroiditis seems to have a higher chance of uh, higher prevalence compared to the one with diffuse variant thyroiditis or focal thyroiditis. In this retrospective study, 31.3% um, of those who en undergone total thyroidectomy with pre-op diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis by cytology were found to have differentiated thyroid carcinoma at histopathological examination. A TPTC was coexistent in 40% of the cases of nodular thyroiditis versus 8.1% compared to the one with diffuse variant thyroiditis. Now, this is very similar to what we have recently observed in a study that we have undertaken. Unfortunately, I cannot divulge the results of the study. It will be presented tomorrow for those who are interested at the Thyroid Master Program uh, organized by Imperial London Diabetes Center in Abu Dhabi. You could uh, uh, maybe go to the uh, ICLDC Center and uh, there's a open link and uh, you can join in. Uh, it's free uh, and I uh, will be more than welcome to see you and to join us for that session. Uh, so with this, it seems that the association coexists. There is no doubt about it but uh, it's uh, still far from clear, and uh, there are still too many unanswered questions. The question here is autoimmunity is leading to cancer or the uh, autoimmune, the immune reaction is secondary uh, to the presence of the cancer. Uh, we know that both conditions, thyroiditis and papillary thyroid cancer, they share common mutation of oncogene such as red PTC, typical OPTC, and P63, which is normally not seen in normal uh, follicular cells. Uh, we know also that uh, uh, maybe, as suggested by some uh, authors, that uh, maybe at the level of the diffuse thyroiditis, it's a pre-neoplastic uh, 
lesions where the markers for uh, PTC are not existent, but with chronicity and time, they could evolve and induce changes that are leading to the formation of uh, 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 thyroid cancer. But again, it doesn't explain why we're seeing this with papillary thyroid cancer and not with other type of cancer. And the other point to keep in mind that patient with nobular thyroiditis seems to behave a little bit differently from those with diffuse thyroiditis. And maybe that should be addressed uh, uh, a little bit more carefully in the same way that we address patient presenting with simple thyroid module, like th uh, having ultrasound and if the ultrasound features are suspicious to carry on with the biopsy. And then contrary to what we used to believe that hyperthyroidism is protective, it seems patients with Graves disease and thyroid nodule um, have a higher risk of having thyroid cancer and hence should be addressed in a similar manner. But again, when they are, when there are nodularity and there are incidental finding of micropapillary carcinoma, which could be incidental, again, this is again going with the um, preconcept that really has been suggested that maybe that could be a pre-stage before they get to the formation of thyroid nodule. And if this is the case, uh, as suggested by a, a recent study by Azizi group, uh, is that uh, the uh, presence of thyroid globulin and high TSH seems to be very closely related, uh, um, related to the a higher prevalence of uh, thyroid cancer. In that case, it makes sense to use LT4, which is proven to provide to suppress TSH and hence leading to the reduction in the risk of PTC. And with this, I'll conclude my, my presentation and uh, thank you for being present with me. Okay, uh, thanks Dr. Ali Khalid for a nice uh, presentation. And uh, now we'll have uh, the floor for uh, discussion. May I invite Dr. Parikh, Dr. Ali and Dr. Elizabeth for uh, uh, first question, Dr. Elizabeth, um, um, uh, for a patient who have recurrent miscarriage and uh, positive anti-TBO, TSH, for example, two. How would you like to manage him? She has like recurrent miscarriage. Right. So if she's fully euthyroid, TSH is two, and the antibodies are positive, what I've shown you are a lot of negative data. So we don't really have good trial evidence of benef benefit for any of the interventions that have been looked at. So I think the best advice right now in those women is to just ensure that they do truly remain euthyroid throughout pregnancy and to monitor the TSH probably every four weeks in the first half of gestation as thyroxin binding globulin levels are rising and requirements may be increasing. Now, uh, Abdel Wahab uh, Suleiman asking a question. You know that uh, somebody who is having Graves disease and who is having recurrent Graves disease went to stop the antithyroid drugs. The lecture was talking about the trap. If we don't have the trap in our laboratory, is there any other indicator that will follow to make sure that to stop this antithyroid drugs for this guy or not. Honestly, we have this uh, Elizabeth uh, trap recently, Tariq knows that, in Hamad Medical Corporation in Qatar, maybe if I am not wrong for the last couple of months, and we use it very nicely now, uh, and it helps us a lot. I would like to hear from you, Elizabeth. It seems you, that you have some answer for those who are not having this to answer our physician. Yeah. Well, I think if you don't have the TRAB, which is probably going to be your most sensitive indicator of the likelihood of, of remission, you have to use other clinical clues. Certainly, goiter size is important. Large goiter certainly predicts people who aren't going to go into remission. And the, you know, the level of initial hyperthyroidism you know, the more profoundly biochemically hyperthyroid somebody is at the outset, the less likely they're going to remit. So clues like that are helpful. Excellent. But in your experience, what about the duration of the antithyroid drugs? For how long how, do you use for this Graves disease? As long as you need to, I think. So in somebody with recurrent Graves where they don't appear to be going into remission, um, I think you can use them indefinitely, as, as David has just suggested. Okay. Tarek, do you have anything to say or yeah. Dr. Ali? Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Very important, actually, point and very practical one as well and of high re relevance to our patients. I remember this particular issue of long-term anti drugs has come to the fore when I was a trainee with Dick Clayton in uh, West Midlands in, uh, in England. 
And I remember at that time, um, uh, he has been actually very much pushing us as trainees to actually give the patient the option of either surgery, radioiodine, or long-term, because he did have actually quite extensive experience with using actually um, uh, anti treatment long-term. And it does actually work. And to be honest, you know, when I can counsel my patients, uh, it has been my own standard practice that I counsel my patients, and this is one of the things I tend actually to offer to them. And to be honest, over the last couple of decades, those who have been actually under my care, taking long-term anti treatment, I cannot remember at all any one of them has got problems. However, you do see actually problems, of course, with radioiodine, and of course, you, 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 you don't want to subject patients to surgery unless there are other indications. So Elizabeth, it does just, yeah. Yeah. just correct yeah, me, just, Elizabeth. Those who are visiting uh, Mr. us as consultants Mr. from Mr. abroad. And Dr. Mr. Ali, Mr. Chairman, you want to say something? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, there is a raising hand, and I think you should follow the sign because before allowing people to speak. Um, okay. I, I agree with Dr. Elizabeth uh, that, um, I mean, clinically, you have uh, clues that can help you one way or another. This, the size of the gorter, by ultrasound, the vascularity, uh, that really is really quite significant. Uh, you could see the difference between someone presenting new with very active, like I call it Christmas tree, um, light, lighting is a Christmas tree, and then really barely any vascularity. It's very, very helpful. Um, you could use, um, uh, and, and so, and, but again, I use long-term therapy with antithyroid, but I cautious people, it's not a drug without side effect. You have to keep monitoring your patient because you do occasionally get patient with presented with side effect. I was yeah. under the impression that Americans are more aggressive and using radioactive iodine therapy more than antithyroid. This is what I have been taught. That has, yeah, that's shifted. It, I think we still are compared to most other regions around the, the globe. But uh, if you look at more recent data in the U.S., we've shifted toward antithyroid drugs. I think the one other comment I might make with regard to really long-term antithyroid drug use is in women of childbearing age, you do need to think about plans for potential pregnancy because of the teratogenicity of those drugs. Thank you. Okay, now a uh, question for Dr. Tariq. Um, uh, from the plasma, um, uh, when um, or uh, for teratoxicosis after COVID infection, for how long it will persist, and if the patient have mild subclinical hyperthyroid post COVID with normal ultrasound and TSI, how would you like to approach? Right. Okay. Regarding the uh, long term sequelae of teratoxicosis occurring post COVID, it is uh, still very early to know what is the long-term actually outcome of these patients. So more data actually will come to the fore. And of course, regular monitoring um, of these patients is highly warranted. Uh, regarding patients with thyroiditis, uh, as I mentioned, you do get the immune type and you, you do get the non-immune type. And uh, the management tend to depend very much actually upon the clinical presentation. So many patients actually with thyroiditis especially painless, do not need any treatment. And those with subacute thyroiditis, you know, they tend mostly actually to revert to EU thyroidism. So, however, more actually, you know, um, uh, evidence will, will emerge in the next few months, I'm sure. Yes, uh, there is also a question for Dr. Al Khalil. Um, and uh, if the patient have either family history or positive anti-TB, is, are they at risk for thyroid cancer? Um, this is a, a nice question. I think um, uh, if you're dealing with children, it seems uh, the familial occurrence, um, it has uh, some bearing. Um, but um, I, I think the um, um, it's very difficult from the association uh, just to say that really does increase risk or not, because as you know, most of the cases identified really were incidental findings. 
Um, so to say, I think is the clinical presentation, the ultrasound features uh, that guide you more so than uh, other criteria. But obviously, uh, TPO are only a marker, uh, and I think I rely on ultrasound sometimes more than 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 the thyroid antibodies, uh, unless the level of thyroid antibodies is excessively high. That makes a little bit of difference. But uh, I think you have to put things together before making a final judgment. There is a question for Dr. Uh, Elizabeth. Dr. Elizabeth. Yeah, uh, when uh, Dr. May Suleiman, she is asking, dear Dr. Beers, do you treat patients undergoing IVF with levothyroxine if TSH is 3.5 with a goal of TSH of less than 2.5? And do you need patient with subclinical hypothyroid TBO negative to have TSH less than 2.5 if planning normal conception or less than 4? Good, good questions for which there is sort of a paucity of data. So there are two very small randomized clinical trials demonstrating that women who are subclinically hypothyroid with a TSH greater than 4 have better IVF outcomes if they get levothyroxine than if they don't. So unequivocally, if women have a TSH greater than four pre-IVF, we should treat them. There are no data <laughs> for if the TSH is 3.5. Um, on the other hand, IVF is expensive. There's really an impetus to get it right. And I don't think there's a whole lot of risk of low-dose levothyroxine. So I think it is reasonable to do that, even in the absence of really great data. Um, should we, in general, try and aim for a woman to have a TSH less than 2.5 prior to conception? I would say if she's already on levothyroxine and we can control that TSH level, that's probably reasonable to do that. Um, but I don't know that there are any data really demonstrating that intervening for women with sort of high normal TSH levels preconception um, makes any difference to outcomes. I don't think the studies really have been done. Yes, uh, there is a question for Dr. Um, uh, Ali Khalil. Um, uh, now, for the patient with thyroid cancer, if they have positive antithyroglobulin antibody from the start, does this affect the prognosis? And what's the role of antithyroglobulin antibody in follow up of patients with thyroid cancer? Well, um, um, I mean, those are two different uh, questions. Um, one, uh, before I get to that question, I would like to comment on uh, the question given to Dr. Elizabeth. Actually, you have to keep in mind that TSH is population dependent. And then uh, when we talk about 3.5, it could be normal for that population. And actually, we did run a study on our local nationals in uh, UAE. And then we found that actually for the first trimester, TSH was 3.5 is the normal range. Our normal is 2.5 and 3.5, um, and and so and and as you mentioned, probably uh, the uh, above four, based on Aziz's studies, which really has done, uh, I think, very good study in this regard. When the antibodies are positive, the chances for successful in vitro fertilization with thyroid with a thyroid medication seems to be better than if thyroid medication is not being used. Correct me is if I'm wrong, but I think. That's the message, right? Correct. Uh, and I, uh, I think even, question, if, even without the antibodies, if the TSH is above four. Right. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the question about uh, thyroid globulin, I think, uh, uh, again, Aziz's studies, uh, they looked in patients uh, who uh, did have thyroid globulin uh, measured before being subjected to surgery, if really cytology was positive. They found a positive correlation between a higher prevalence rate for papillary thyroid carcinoma versus those who had a low or normal thyroid globulin level. And then he associated that also, that if your TSH is a little bit higher than normal, even at the high normal level, that those population, this, this group of patients seems to be at higher risk for having thyroid cancer. So, uh, but in thyroid cancer patient, uh, prior to surgery, I think the only case was made once by uh, Dr. Zahrani, Ali Zahrani, that uh, it, when thyroid globulin was measured before uh, surgery, it was undetectable. And then they did surgery, and actually the patient uh, did not uh, have of the type of cancer, was not responding to radioactivity subsequently when the patient was subjected to, 
surgery. But I don't personally, I don't find uh, a value to do serum thyroglobulin in, in patient going for surgery. I don't think it will add uh, um, a bearing, except to tell you uh, after surgery, if the thyroglobulin drop is not significant, um, is may maybe because of the level before surgery was not uh, high. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, I just want to ask you about the antibodies. Somebody is asking who's the patient to check the antibodies, although TSH is within normal limits. You know, T TBO is becoming as a routine CBC test, and everybody is asking for that. What is the significance? And somebody is asking what is the threshold? Both good questions. I think in the pregnancy setting, there are no guidelines to do universal TPO antibody screening right now. No, nobody, there's disagreement about TSH, but nobody really is arguing for TPO screening at the moment. So the guidelines about what you do in somebody who's TPO positive, you thyroid in pregnancy are just if you happen to know that, but you're, it's not recommended that we check it. Cause, and I don't think it's helpful to check because we don't really know what to do about those women. Um, the other piece of that, sorry, was... It's the whether the threshold, the level, you know? Oh, yes. And that's very assay dependent. Um, so there is a lack of good harmonization across assays in pregnancy, particularly, but probably I think also outside pregnancy as to what's truly positive. And in, if you look carefully, there have been studies demonstrating that even within the range of normal, there may be a little bit of an effect of higher titers. Uh, in pregnancy uh, compared to lower ones, and maybe we're not putting our, our thresholds in the right place. So a good question, but not one with a good answer yet. Uh, but admit my ignorance, if I am wrong. What I know that TBO, either positive or negative, we don't go for the level it's safe, we, right or not? We do not, except that it's a little bit artificial where that line is drawn. And Tim Korovar in particular has done some work in European cohorts, in, specifically in the pregnancy setting, suggesting that maybe the manufacturer's reference range is not always the right range, and maybe it really needs to be assay and population specific as, as to where you draw that line. Dr. Ali, uh, uh, yes, Dr. Ali, you want to, to say anything? Ali Khalil? No, no, uh, I think she said it. Uh, uh, okay. It's not a routine test that really we do on patient, but again, if I do my ultrasound and I see changes within the ultrasound, the suggestive of thyroiditis, this is the time usually I do it. Okay, thanks, Dr. Ali. Thanks, uh, Dr. Elizabeth and Dr. Parik for a nice presentation. I would like also to thank my uh, co-chair, Dr. Amin Jalushi. Uh, 